her presidential address in August of 2014, Sister Carol gave a speech that is memorable, to say the least. If you Google her and the presidential address to LCWR, it will be a treat for you to read. But I just want to quote a couple of lines from that. In that speech, she suggests, she doesn't put it in these words, but I took liberties. Um, she suggests that our task as children of God is, quote, put our ear to God's heart, listen carefully, and allow God to sing through our lives. Is that remarkable? So, the song of our lives is to be God's song. That's our work. That's what we're called to be. I suggest we listen carefully to the song that Sister Carol is about to share with us as she shares her thoughts on the charism of the Sisters of St. Joseph. Please welcome Sister Carol. I wasn't nervous until now. <laughs> You've sat there and had people say things and you're looking around saying, who? About whom is she speaking? But I, I really am delighted to be here. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks so much. Uh, and thank you. Um, you are the reason why we're here. So I am absolutely delighted to be here with um, what's referred to these days as the family of Joseph. Anybody here in the family of Joseph? All right. Okay. So we're all brothers and sisters, right? We're all founders and foundresses. Okay. We're part of a very long story for sure. So I want to thank you for inviting me because I'm a member of the family of Joseph also. And um, you've probably figured out by now, as my table mates did, that I'm not from Boston. <laughs> you want to guess where I'm from? Yeah. Well, Suzanne already told you. Philadelphia, but somebody at my table said, you can't mistake the Philadelphia accent. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm Boston. <laughs> There's still someone in this room whom I will not mention at the moment, but when she spoke to my congregation, she said, hello, sisters, I'm so glad to be here. My hat is just really warm. <laughs> You, many of you could probably stand up, actually. <laughs> you recognize yourselves, right? But really, truly, thank you, thank you, thank you. And really, thank you for being in this family of Joseph. You know, there's some conversation going on these days about um, charism life uh, being a movement, you know, that, um, you know, this whole idea that uh, a congregation doesn't have charism. You know, not in this room, but some, some congregations actually say, you know, so many of these people, they have our charism. No, that's not true. The charism has us. The charism has us. And speaking of charism, I have this wonderful joke that I like to use to distinguish. You know, charisms are not all the same. Do you know that? Okay. I know it's hard to believe that there are other charisms besides the Sisters of St. Joseph of Charism. <laughs> But you know, we're all inclusive and we love the dear neighbor without distinction. So I just want to kind of share with you this little joke actually, that's based on um, the nativity scene, you know, the first one where, you know, Jesus is, is born. And there is a Franciscan at the scene. And you know, the Franciscan charism is justice and peace and the integrity of creation and awe and wonder. <gasps> Franciscan charism. There's also a Dominican at this nativity scene. And you know the Dominican charism is preach, truth, and justice. Preach. And there's a Jesuit at the nativity also. And we all know the Jesuit charism. Okay? Well, the story goes like this to distinguish the charisms. The Franciscan comes upon the nativity scene and is just overcome with this incredible sense of awe that this Franciscan is, is looking at the Word of God. 
and, and just kind of goes out of the manger and just stands there <sighs> caught in rapture. You know? The Dominican comes upon the scene and is so taken with this incredible revelation of truth that the Dominican runs outside of the manger and begins to build a pedestal, a pulpit, and begins preaching about the Incarnation. The Jesuit is in the nativity scene. He sees a little boy there in the manger, kind of sidles himself over to Joseph and says, um, Joe, see you got a little boy there. He already looks pretty smart. You talk to me a little later, I'd give you an application for some of the best universities. <laughs> There's a difference among charisms. There really is. But I think one of the most important things about charisms is that they really are takes on the gospel. You know, if you kind of hold a, a, a you know a prism up to a sunbeam, you know, depending on where you stand around that prism, you get a different light. That, that's that's what charisms are. There are prisms, lenses on the gospel. And so when we talk about the Joseph family, which I'd like to visit with you for a little bit tonight, in terms of the call to the moor, because that's Joseph family language. The Franciscans don't talk about the call to the moor. It's not that they don't do it, but they don't talk about it. Dominicans don't talk about the call to the moor. The Jesuits actually sort of talk about the call to the moor, the Magis. You know, um, parentheses, I'm in Philadelphia, St. Joe's University in Philadelphia. Everywhere you go in Philadelphia, there are billboards and bumper stickers that say, Magis. You know? And that's all it says. It's a great advertisement because people are like, Magis, what is that? You know. But when we talk about charisms and the Joseph charism, we are talking about a way of life, a way of the gospel. And so my conversation with you tonight, my little reflection really, is brief. And I thought, what can I possibly say that would first and foremost affirm who you are? Because as Hosea just said, you are the heartbeat of the Joseph family, of the charism, in this particular place in our world, where your feet are every day. You are the charism because you don't have the charism, the charism has you. That's why you're with the Joseph family and not with the Franciscans, or the Dominicans, or even the Jesuits. So what I'd like to do is just kind of share three stories tonight. Because, you know, sometimes, especially after dinner and dessert, it's like, oh my God, I have to make my eyes stay awake, you know? <laughs> well, you really don't, you can take a nap if you'd like. But I think these stories for me, they, they say something about what does this CSSJ charism, this call to the more, what does it feel like? You can read a lot of stuff about it, but what does it feel like? What does this take on the gospel feel like? What does it mean to say that we are the charism of the Sisters of St. Joseph? We are that take on the gospel as we walk around where we are each day in our life and in our ministry. So the first story I'd like to tell you is, um, these are all true stories, by the way, but this one is about someone in my family, and you've, some of you have heard about her before. We have a queen in our family, you know. Last time some of you heard me, she was two, you know. She's now seven, okay? But she is absolutely the queen. Does anybody else have a queen in their family? Okay. Yeah. She now has a little brother who will never be a king. He will always be a little prince but she is definitely the queen. Her name is Mackenzie. And she is now in second grade. So when I was talking to her, probably around Thanksgiving, and I was asking her about second grade, and she said, oh, it's, it's very good, Aunt Carol. I said, oh, that's good. What's so good about it? Well, she said, I am a leader. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, and I'm thinking, yeah, I imagine you are. <laughs> And I said, oh, that's good, Ken. She said, yes, I, I am a leader. The teacher says that I am a leader. I said, I'm not, I'm not doubting that at all. And then I was, I was basically trying to say 
that the teacher is really helping to develop all the gifts of the children, you know? So I was going on and on and on about that. This is what this child did. Aunt Carol, wait a minute. The teacher is encouraging all the children to do their very best, but I am a leader. <laughs> Lest I get confused at any kind of affirmation and inviting children into the bigness that they could be. And I said, oh, I said, okay, what does that mean? And she stopped for a minute and she said, actually, don't you love when they start using these words? <laughs> actually, Aunt Carol, I am a leader because the teacher asks me to do things first because I'm not afraid to be wrong. So the first offering tonight about how is the CSSJ charism, the call to the more, how does it feel in us who are kind of caught by this charism? I think it feels like a leader who knows that they kind of step out there, whatever the first thing is, they step out there because they're not afraid that whatever they're going to do is like not right, whether it's political or whatever. They're not, they're not afraid. What does that mean? I think it has something to do with this life, this religious life that all of us belong to in this particular charism family. We belong to a life that it's a radical response to the gospel. Radical response to the gospel in a particular history and culture. The radical response that's around here, I recognize some of the names around here. The radical response of our founding days. It was radical in that day. What's radical today? In 2015, where your feet are. What's radical? What's the not afraid to be wrong and willing to do something first? What does that look like? I think it has something to do with this language in our charism family that talks about uh, a love and a willingness for relationships and this service of the dear neighbor without distinction, you know that language? Does it sound familiar? Okay. All that means is that we are called in this Joseph family to live out the gospel in such a way that everything that we do, we're first at stepping out there where our feet are, that our love is active, that it's all inclusive, the circle keeps getting wider for the Joseph family. Why? Because the gospel says the circle has to get wider. A love that's active, a love that's all inclusive, a love that's reconciling. Now there's a hard one, there's a hard one. Today's gospel is one of those great examples where the disciples say to Jesus, how many times should I forgive? You know, and they feel all puffed up about themselves, seven times, you know? Do you know the answer? Jesus says, no, not seven times. And then he does some, you know, math. But what he's really saying there, the scripture writers say, is that the answer to the question is how many times do I forgive? The answer is yes. That's the answer. It's not mathematical. It's a relationship answer. We forgive every single time. We're not afraid to do that because we're leaders. We're not afraid to be wrong. We step out in relationship that is active, inclusive, reconciling, and unioning. Have you ever walked into a room where you kind of know as soon as you walk in that you're not welcome? You ever had that experience? It's kind of hard in the Joseph family to have that experience, but there probably are some places in the Joseph family where walking into a room for at least one person in that room, they know in that much time that they're not welcome. That's what a unioning love tries to erase. That's why the dear neighbor without distinction is always welcome. So are you leaders? Yes. Are you leaders because you are not afraid to go first, to do the active loving first, whether it comes back or not? To do the all-inclusive loving first, whether it comes back or not. To do the reconciling love first, whether it comes back to you or not. To do the unioning love first, whether it comes back to you or not. I suspect that I'm talking to a lot of Mackenzies. 
you know, the radical response to the gospel in this particular place. I think of, first of all, the weather. Oh my goodness. You know, you made the world news, you know? But, I mean, that's what being a leader and not being afraid to do something first, that, that's what it means. In the, I'm sure there were a few people in this room who complained, you know, <laughs> during the snows, you know? What about the trial that's going on now for Joe Harvey? What about the immigration issues right here in Boston? What about trafficking? What about the presence of abject poverty, interesting descriptor of abject poverty in relationship to the obscene accumulation of wealth that's going on right here? It has to be going on right here because it's going on everywhere. What about the environmental destruction, the racism, the sexism, the classism, the militarisms, and all the other things you can think of? How is it that this family of Joseph exercises the call to the Lord, the willingness to, as Mackenzie says, not be afraid to go first in stepping out with that kind of love? So the call to the moor is not about quantitative. You know, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Philadelphia have this notion of excellence, you know. I think the Boston girls do, too. <laughs> you know, it's kind of in, it's part of our little DNA, you know. But you know, it took me a long time to realize that this call to the moor is, is not quantitative. It's qualitative. So I think the Mackenzie question is, what does my leadership look like where my feet are every day that puts flesh on the call to the more? How are my relationships, basically? Are they inclusive? Are they reconciling? Are they unioning? And am I willing to try to do that first? Because I'm not afraid of making a mistake. Second story. Um, my mom lived the last 17 years of her life in a nursing home. And I would say for the last uh, three years of her life, she didn't even know who I was. Not because it's about me, but I saw her most regularly. And the last two years of her life, I could not understand anything, anything that she said. The last thing that I remember talking with my mom about, where I knew that she knew that I knew what she was saying. Did you ever have those conversations? Yeah. If anybody else came in right now and asked, listen to that question, they'd probably <laughs> take me away. And you too, because you all sat there and said, mm -hmm. <laughs> But at this point in my mom's life, she was eating just all soft food. She had aspirated two or three times, and it was just, it was, it was horrible. So a sister friend of mine and I went to visit her, and it was around lunchtime. <clears throat> she loved chocolate, anything. Chocolate milkshake, chocolate ice cream, chocolate pudding, anything soft and chocolate. So I took her a chocolate milkshake. And my friend and I had lunch. So we had little sandwiches and potato chips, and my mother loved, loved junk food, <laughs> potato chips especially. So we're sitting there eating, and we're talking, and my mother is like reaching over to the paper that I had my sandwich on with the potato chips, you know, trying to get one. And I, God forgive me, like you do with a child, just kept on talking and just moved the potato chips closer to me. <laughs> Reaching out to get the potato chip closer to me. Well, finally I realized I couldn't stand it any longer, so I took a potato chip. Now my mother hadn't spoken clearly in a while, okay. I took a potato chip and when I tell you that I broke off the teeniest, tiniest, little morsel of a potato chip that you could possibly put in somebody's hand. And I put it in her hand. She looked at me. And she looked at it. And she looked at me. And she looked at it. 
And as clear as I'm saying this to you, she said, can you spare it? <laughs> I think that question, can you spare it, has something to do with the call to the more. Maybe a maxim or two might help in terms of what, what does that look like when we're faced each day with people looking at us either on our emails or our phones or actually walking into our office doors or up and down the corridors or in the parking lots. And they're really looking at us with that same kind of look that says, can you spare it? You know, Can you spare it? A moment of the charism for me. Can you spare it? Here's what one of the maxims says. Live as much as you can. Live as much as you can in such a way that your life in honor of the Spirit, may be a continual act of the most pure and perfect charity that you are able to practice toward God. I think for me, and possibly for you, the can you spare it moments are really those moments that pretty much take every ounce of us. Did you ever have any of those? Did you ever encounter somebody who you had one nerve left and they found it? <laughs> this notion in this maxim of a life that is lived so completely emptied of self and one unioned with God so that communion, unity, always in relationships that are moving more towards union, not less. More towards communion, not less. More towards inclusion, not less. More towards when somebody leaves you after an encounter, they are more of themselves because of having countered, can countered somebody in the Joseph family and not less of themselves. Can you spare it? Here's another maxim that helps me about what does that look like where my feet are? Can you spare it? It's one of my favorite maxims. Give all the happiness you can to those who give you a great deal of unhappiness. <laughs> Comma, here's the kicker, and give it willingly. Give all the happiness you can to those who give you a great deal of unhappiness and give it willingly. To whom do I give the best effort of my heart in my ministry, in my relationships? To whom do I give the best effort of my heart? Who needs my more? Who's looking at me the way my mother looked at me about that potato chip and saying as clearly as they possibly can through their anger, through their nonsense, through their ranting, through their tears, who's saying to me, can you spare it? Third story and final one. My grandmother was the wisest woman I have ever met in my life. She went to third grade. There were 59 of us grandchildren that she had, and we each thought that we were the only one. You know how grandmas can be like that, you know. But my grandmother had this saying that when you were in any kind of trouble, you know, with your siblings, or you got in trouble with your mom and dad or something, she always called you by your full baptismal name, <laughs> Carol Ann. My mom did the same thing, but when you got your full baptismal name, you knew it was not going to be about baptism. <laughs> Running down the steps, I remember my brother saying, oh my God, this isn't about baptism, it's about extreme unction. <laughs> but you'd be telling Grandma, you know, this story about, you know, pouring your heart out, you know, about how your brother did this and you got in trouble and so forth. And she would just look at you and she would say, Carol Ann, Grandma's going to tell you. You have an opportunity in this situation to be as big as God wanted you to be on the day of your baptism. 
the call to the moor in these evolving times sounds like my grandmother. It's about us being asked to be as big as God wanted us to be on the day of our baptism or the day of our commitment. Some of you have seen these before. A little set of, you know what these are? Okay, the Russian nested dolls. There are 10 dolls inside here, 10. You can imagine what the smallest one looks like, okay? It's a little tiny dot of wood. If I took them all out and stretched them out, they're fascinating to look at, just absolutely amazing. It's a good example, I think, at least for me, of what the call to the moor looks like when I try to think about the times that we're living in and ask myself, what does it mean to be as big as God wanted me to be on the day of my baptism in a particular situation? Now, I'm going to step aside from the podium here so you can just take a look. <laughs> on one level, I'm already as big as God ever imagined me to be on the day of all of my sacraments. Okay? But you know, these Russian nested dolls are powerful, powerful images for the capacity that we each have as, first of all, as human beings, and the capacity as members of the family of Joseph right now to really hold that question all the time. Whenever we encounter anyone or anything, any kind of situation, where we can almost feel the charism saying to us, there's more here that's being asked of you. More relationship, more love, more forgiveness, more inclusion, more compassion, more gentleness, more mercy, more, more, more. The little tiny piece of wood that's in there, the little, the tenth one, is about a, a way of knowing that I know that I'm safe. And I don't know about you, but there are times in the charism where I just want to be that tiniest little doll. I want to be safe and I want to be secure. I just want to get through the week. Did you ever have those situations? Maybe I just want to get through the day. Maybe I just want to get through this dinner, okay? You know? But we've had a lot of those situations. We have to because of the way we're living our lives so relationally. We have to have those situations where we just want to not be small. And it's not, it's not about big and small. This is about the spaciousness of our hearts and the spaciousness of our minds. So inside these, these dolls are all different sizes. And there's a size that is appropriate for being safe and secure. And there's a little more where I belong and I'm identified, Irish, German, Catholic, Regis, whatever it might be, Sisters of St. Joseph. And there's another size where there's a little more about being self-determined. You're helping a lot of people in your ministries to have a sense of themselves, to be empowered, to be self-determined. You're helping them to be big to be as big as God wanted them to be on the day of their baptism. And then there's a little more, where we have some awareness that there is some power beyond us, most of us call it God. Then there's a little more, a level of knowing that we know that we can make things happen, we can succeed. Then there's a little more, where we realize we're part of a community, the common good kind of seeps into our consciousness. And then there's a big space inside of us, where we have to take a leap and this is where I think the call to the war comes in, at this second level of consciousness, of evolution, that says everything is connected. My capacity to live the call to the war is connected to your capacity to call it out of me. My capacity to be a full-fledged member of the Joseph family is dependent on your capacity to challenge me to do it. There's a level of knowing that we know that everything is connected. And then there's more. There's a level of knowing that not only is everything connected, but everything is interconnected. What happens to Regis happens at the retreat center. What happens in Bethany happens in another ministry. And then there's a level that says in this room, what happens to the Joseph congregation in Boston happens to Philadelphia. What happens to Philadelphia in Boston happens to St. Augustine, Florida. And what happens to the Joseph charism in this country happens to India, where 1,200 of our sisters are. 
And what happens to the Joseph charism happens to the Franciscan charism. And what happens to the Franciscan charism happens to the Dominican charism. And what happens to the Catholics happens to the Jews. And what happens to the Jews happens to the Muslims. Do you see what starts to happen? Be as big as God wanted you to be on the day of your baptism. To in fact hold the entire world in your heart while your feet are where they are every day. So I think the question before us when we think about the CSSJ charism and the call to the more, the question before us always and everywhere is this, am I as big as God needs me to be? As big as God dreamed me to be? Or do I choose to make myself small? so that my heart and my mind and my feelings are safe. They go unchallenged. They keep me comfortable. So my dear sisters and brothers in the Joseph family, in this charism that we don't have a charism, the charism has us. And so the call to the more is an everyday, thousand times a day, it's an invitation to go first, because we're not afraid of being wrong. It's a challenge and invitation to look into the eyes of everybody you meet and hear their eyes say to you, can you spare it? Can you spare me some active, all-inclusive, reconciling, union and love? And I think most and foremost, the call to the more is an invitation to discover just how big God wanted each of us to be on the day of our baptism. And to make that discovery over and over and over and over again. Yes, for sure, the CSSJ mission calls. The charism challenges us. I don't know if it does you, but it sure does me. And the world of Boston, or wherever you, your feet are, and the world of the larger world awaits for a charism a call to the more that actually gets lived out. It's for people like you and me. I'm just Ed and Kay's daughter. You're just somebody's daughter, somebody's spouse. We are just the people of God that God's crazy about. And for whatever reason, in God's incredible beauty of mind and imagination, God's called us together in this Joseph family to live this call to the more. A reminder that everything is always and everywhere already won. Our challenge, I think, is to make sure we don't subtract from that at any given moment. Maybe we can't add to it, but we ought not subtract from it. So I encourage you to be as big as God wanted you to be on the day of your baptism. I encourage you to hold a potato chip and keep it as an image when you're dealing with somebody who is saying to you by God knows what way, attitude, behavior, whatever, can you spare it? And I encourage you to be little Mackenzie's, you know? Yes, Aunt Carol, the teacher is encouraging all the children, but I am a leader. <laughs>